from CSU. I don't know if you knew that. If you want to know where you can watch it after you leave, we have some sheets in the back. I have my video production class uh, here videotaping this. So I figure you might as well do something you like and get credit for it. So uh, and then we're, if you missed any of these today, you can go back and look at those. And uh, first I want to do some thanks and then kind of ask some questions of our audience and then we'll get started while we wait for um, JP. So before I introduce my guests, you know, first I want to thank Cleveland State's administration. They pay good money to be a platinum sponsor. I mean, they've done it for 15 years for CIFL. This is part of the deal we have with that. When you see two pages in their program guide and one of them is this event, someone paid for that. So I, I like to thank the administration. And we've done these for 10 years. Like, there's a guy that left here who says he's come 10 years straight for this. And we use this in our classes. It's nice that we have filmmakers that come in and share their knowledge. And, you know, after we'll give you a nice Q&A section. And those of you that are shy or just enamored by the talents of these people up here, they always kind of stay around and talk to you very nice mm -hmm. until they have to get to their car, get home to an airplane sometimes. So uh, we'll make that happen. I also want to thank Evan Lieberman, uh, who uh, teaches with us here, kind of runs our area uh, for putting this together. A lot of phone calls, a lot of work. And uh, uh, Alita helped him pick up all most people today up to this point and organize it. And I want to thank Zach and Bernie back there. Zach is the TriCaster goddess who uh, got this onto a YouTube channel and our athletic department let us use their TriCaster and we moved our cameras to there. So it's a nice collaborative effort. And Bernie directing this for when our intercoms died, I'm yelling at him for being on his cell phone directing. And what he was doing was installing communication with the camera and so they all went on a conference call for him, <laughs> which I thought was ingenious. So I yelled at him and he, he did it and I'm sorry about that. Um, you know, before we get to our guests, so basically we're going to talk for about an hour, then about a half hour Q&A, and, but we want to know who you are because I have all these questions that probably won't relate to what any of you are interested, but first I got a few questions. First of all, how many of you are Cleveland State University students? Raise your hand. That's a good number. How many of you are in our film and media area? So, okay, most, but there's, there's some other on the outside. That's good. And then, how about from any other universities come through here? Good. I would say I'm on the advisory board for the Howard A. Medicine. And okay, great. Excellent. Thank you for coming. And uh, who's here just because they're kind of interested in editing? They, you know, that's just kind of their thing. Now, with your hands up, how many of you have completely edited a project. So the ones that are interested have completely edited a project. That's good, that, that, that is excellent. Okay. All right, well first, let me introduce our panelists. And I should know them. J.P. Costello, who will be here, and we'll, we'll walk him up here. You're gonna have to help him get up over there when it comes time so he doesn't spill over you. And we have Keith Potizan, Danielle Miller, and Alona Jerk. And you know, the I guess the first thing we're just going to talk about is give us a little brief bio about yourself and talk to us about the film that, that was presented here. Sure. And uh, give a little background about you. Sure. My name is uh, Keith Potizak, and I uh, work full time at a video production company in Mayfield Heights uh, called Think Media Studios. Uh, I'm a senior editor there. I've been there for almost 11 years, basically since the company's uh, inception. Mm -hmm. um, I have worked on a wide variety in editorial from feature-length documentaries to half-hour television specials to corporate work to commercials and everything in between. Um, and this uh, particular film I worked on for this year's festival is, in, uh, is entitled A More Civil War, which uh, took place over the four days of the RNC and uh, it was a big race to finish it, but we got it done, we got it in here, and, and we just had our premiere uh, last Thursday, and we have our second showing this evening. Excellent. I'm Danielle Miller. I work with Keith at Think Media Studios, um, so yeah, same kind of thing. Um, uh, we actually co-edited More Civil War together, and uh, I edited uh, and directed uh, Burn the Ships about uh, women's professional fast pitch softball. Um, that is my fourth feature documentary. Um, our first uh, did with the Drepia, who directed more Civil War right here. 
Kingmi premiered at CAFF in 2012. Yeah. Yeah. Did you? Uh, did you work somewhere before Think Media? Or, uh, I worked at another production company in Twinsburg called Classic Color Productions for about a year and a half out of school. I worked with them when they were in their basement. Okay. In Sagmore Hills. Yeah, the yes. Bacons. Yeah. The Bacons. Yes. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Alona Jurek. I um, have worked for a company called Mosher Media for about two years. Um, and this was actually my first big feature length project. Um, was uh, working on Breaking Balls. Uh, it's a documentary about um, the local Cleveland bocce scene up in Wycliffe and the Wycliffe INA. and kind of follows three gentlemen as they go through the uh, one of the Wycliffe tournament seasons. And um, I've been working in video production, I'd say, for about two, three years, mostly on short form uh, advertisements and uh, more editorial, ed like editorial content for companies and commercial stuff as opposed to a feature length film, but this is really more what I enjoy. Great. I'm going to give you a question from a student perspective. Uh, what formal education did you have, and what would have you wished that your teachers would have prepared you for, for getting ready to work in the sometimes cruel and rewarding world of film and video production? Um, I have a little bit of a unique uh, answer to that, as I didn't originally go to college for this. Uh, I went to Kent State University um, and I went to become a broadcast journalism major. Sure. Wanted to be a, the next ESPN uh, sports center sort of sportscaster. Um, and I was like three years in to my, my program and we have a great uh, television studio down there, student run. Mm -hmm. and. We started doing these live basketball games. We started doing them all by ourselves as students, and they were massive productions. And I just really started to fall in love with the behind the scenes of television more than in front of the camera. And I really kind of thought to myself, you know, do I really want to make $12,000 in rural Iowa for eight years before, before you know, even trying to become you know something so so I actually just continued out my degree luckily there was tons of extracurriculars at Kent that I could still work on post-production things that I enjoyed I just carried out my degree and I decided to go straight through for my master's um, in which I sort of made up my master's degree and focused it on video production because I knew I, I, I wasn't going to be able to find a job um, Yet I wasn't ready, so mm -hmm. I just kind of bought myself, literally bought, right. uh, yeah. very expensively <laughs> bought myself uh, some more time and um, kind of just honed my skills uh, on my own. Um, and then the second part of the question, um, you know, I, I guess the one thing is, it's not really what I wish I was taught, but I wish more people would just understand that you're not going to learn everything in a, in a class, in a, in a one hour, hour and a half long class. There's just too much. There's too much to cover once a week, twice a week, however long. So you have to just do some self-educating. There's just no way about, you know, there's no way around it. Um, and, and, and that's kind of just the, the most important thing is, you know, everybody wants to be like, well, we didn't learn that in class. Well, you know, there, you have to have the drive to do it by yourself as well. God, I love that answer. <laughs> I, I couldn't have fed that better. Because <laughs> that's my whole thing. It's like, I go, my goal is to teach you to teach yourself. That's what I can, I can't teach you everything. But anyways, yeah. Danielle, where'd you go? Uh, I went to the Art Institute of Pittsburgh okay. uh, for digital media production, but I knew that I wanted to be an editor going in. So I actually partnered up with somebody who wanted to be a DP, and we would take the same classes at different times, and she would shoot all of my projects, oh. and I would edit all of her projects. Okay. So we kind of doubled down. and. Yeah, to piggyback off of what he said, there was a point about halfway through school when I was thinking, I'm not getting out of this what I want to be getting out of this. I didn't feel like I was learning as much as I could be. And I, I realized then I had access to so much equipment and people who were very driven, and it was, yeah, you're going to get out what you put in. And so it was, I'm going to bust my butt for, uh, you know, outside of class too, and I'm just going to keep going. And I guess what I wish my teachers had told me is, 
I was surrounded by some people who I would imagine that none of these people are in this room because if you're here it says something about wanting to be here but uh, there are people who are complaining about it it's, it's too hard and I think some people get into this industry because like, oh it's gonna be fun well it is hard but if you don't think that that hard stuff is fun also right. you're in the wrong field because it's it's long hours and especially as an editor I think Keith and I have been lucky that we work with people who have been gracious about giving credit but as an editor, you're in the shadows a lot of the time, and you know, you're not you're not getting that attention that you would be getting in a different role. So you have to do it because you love it. Yeah. Cool. Uh, well, I went to the Cleveland Institute of Art, um, which is a really unique experience because it's art school. And if anybody's ever been to art school in this room, you know that um, things aren't necessarily as straightforward as, say, a Kent State education would be in terms of teaching you. They can teach you how to use the software, they can teach you how to go out and hold a camera, but at the end of the day, it's what you make of it, is what it comes down to. And I learned really quickly, again, kind of to piggyback off of you guys, that um, you need to utilize those resources to the best of your ability if you're gonna make something out of it. Um, one of our unofficial mottos was, it is what you make of it. So, uh, while I really enjoyed my education, I feel like a lot of what I wasn't taught, I had to kind of learn in the field in terms of um, how specifically to interact with clients, you know, on a more commercial yeah. basis and how to be more professional like that. Because when you go to art school, you're making art. You know, you're making, you're, you're using video production, but in an installative format, in a more of an art format, whereas they don't teach you how to do a documentary, right. you know? And that's kind of something that real world experience can't necessarily live up to, um, well, I mean, what you learn in college doesn't really necessarily live up to real world, world experience. Um, and you have to go out and kind of push yourself in order to learn those things, in order to continue doing those things. Because you can take an English class and learn how to tell a story, but once you get out there and you start assembling all that footage and trying to tell that story yourself, it's a completely different process. And it's really fulfilling to be able to do once you're able to do it. Great. Who was your favorite teacher or mentor outside of that? that kind of got you going and gave you the confidence to keep going? Um, I actually had a, a, a professor at Ken who had a, a major background in investigative journalism. And he was sort of new, and he came in sort of later in my, in my education. 98% of the students hated him because he was honest and yeah. brutally honest <laughs> and you know uh, they were used to yeah this is pretty good yeah, yeah. this is pretty good right. when it really wasn't yeah you know and your baby's up yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> and and he was so honest and i remember i i did a project and he just i mean right in front of the class he just tore it up and I, I was embarrassed and, I, and I, I had too much pride in myself and I was like, okay, I gotta take this more seriously. Yeah. And you know, I could look around the room of that class and pick out who was going to be successful. I just knew it from watching the projects and, and, and he was the, the main reason. If, if you really wanted to be successful, you loved him. If you wanted to just coast, you hated him. So uh, I, I, he was definitely a big turning point. Uh, mine was somebody I knew in high school named John Masilko, who was uh, oh, old John. grandma. You uh, know John? Good friends with He's the best. Yeah. Yeah, and his, I loved him because he was just like endlessly supportive. It's yes. like, what do you want to do? You want to work on the moon? We're going to get you on the moon. Right. Um, and he still is. I mean, the, even now he reaches out every so often. And, and he's like that with so many kids. At, he was yeah. at Brunswick High School where mm -hmm. I went to school. And, um, he does great work with those kids. He, he does. He I mean, does. Like, I mean they great work. awards with this, the, the program. Yeah, no, he was amazing. Yeah. Come on up. Yeah. I'm late. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so sorry, guys. No, no problem. No problem. Yeah. So, yeah, like his, I think it's. Is so there any one thing he did, though, that kind of like made you feel like this is why I should be doing what I want to do? Uh, I don't know that I can say that. I actually didn't yeah. work in the program that much. Um, I was new to it, and I think that's what it was. It was like kind of blind support. Mm -hmm. He didn't even need to know right. if I had any talent at all. It, he didn't care. It was yeah. just like he believed in his kids. So having somebody pushing you like that, you know, it wasn't like the constant praise. It was just um, telling me that if I wanted something bad enough, that I could get it. Yeah, that's great. 
how they treat you in the Art Institute over there. Is there oh, well. Is that um, Kasumi over there? Or yeah, Kasumi actually was one of my favorite professors. Yeah. I was I was going to bring up Kasumi, and I was sure. going to bring up Sarah Paul. Okay. Uh, we're two of my favorite professors. It's hard to pick one, you sure. know? It's like asking a parent to pick their favorite child, you know, or a dog mm -hmm. mom to pick their favorite puppy. And um, it, the, in art school, they really they push you to think of things differently and to think of things in different ways. So when you think you're going in one direction, they'd always stop you and say, well, now what if you do it this direction? You know, what if you, and the basic, the basic idea is, what if you rub some dirt on it? You know, what if you burn it and start over? What happens if you approach it a different direction? Never go with your first instinct because it's usually wrong and it's usually garbage. So um, when, when I try to approach that in a, in a film way and in a video way, Things get really messy, but it's easy to just delete things off of your timeline and start over as opposed to, you know, literally burning it to the ground. But my professors always taught me that it's okay to start over, to start completely from scratch if you hate it, you know, or even if you love it. Sometimes it's better the second, the third, the fourth, the twentieth time around, you know, and never be afraid to continue trying and continue pushing it. I'm going to bring it back to the beginning here just okay, so they yeah. can kind of get them and beat you. Uh, this is J.P. Castell. Castell is Castell. correct, yeah. And uh, if you could just give us a little brief bio in uh, kind of what you you currently did in post-production on the film sure. that we're seeing here today. Yeah, so um, my name is J.P. Castell. I'm 28, currently single. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> Very current. Anyways, um, so uh, we have a film here at the festival, Under the Net. It's a virtual reality project. Um, I was a producer on it, um, but I also do a lot of post-soup as well. Um, I work in commercials a lot and feature post-soup and producing, um, so all that kind of stuff. And uh, I went to school at UCLA. So. Went to school at UCLA. Yeah, Great. Los Angeles. So Great. Okay, well. Let's, let's move on and we'll get into the techie stuff here. Um, with te technology doubling within a year, as, you know, the software releases come out quicker, 50 more plugins than there was, when there was 20 the year before. Uh, what impact does this have on you getting a project completed when trying to stay current in your craft? You had anything that you're kind of working and then all of a sudden it's like this other stuff comes in. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, I guess are we going left to right? Yeah, no, we just go yeah. Okay. Um, oh man, so uh, VR is a pain in the ass. Um, so it reminds me a lot, I don't know if any of you guys know the old red days where you'd get an R3D and we'd shoot it and we couldn't even watch it. You know, you had to like load it to R3D manager or some horrible thing. But um, so VR, the biggest problem is distribution. Um, there's five, six different players and different headsets that you can use and our film actually in the festival we have nine different renders of it so that the audio specifically will work in a spatial way. So it is constantly changing and big guys like Samsung and other people are coming like Vive are coming in and they're trying to make a standard but it's sort of like HD Blu-ray versus, you know, or HD camera or HD DVD right. versus Blu-ray. And so it's, uh, it's really challenging. But the second something new comes along you can really adapt it and it's really great but it just changes everything. Right. And a lot of times in post, you're trying to think back to the beginning to think about what can we do here that's correct so that we can get to where we need to go. And it's sure. really hard to do that after the fact. How's that? As far as, uh, I have a different perspective in terms of uh, long, -form, long form of documentary editing. Um, a lot of that is based on concepts and principles. So um, software updates and technology updates, for me, don't affect me a whole lot. Um, you know, as long as the monkey can push the button, right. <laughs> I'm okay, right. you know. Right. Um, so, you know, storytelling will not be affected by technology. Um, so, in terms of that, you know, it doesn't affect too much. Now, they do make things faster and easier and, and you know, like JP said, you know, now I can pull red footage right into Premiere and I don't need to convert it and anything like that. So it is getting actually easier and quicker to get going. Right. And, and that is one thing that, um, that is very beneficial to a, an editor. Okay, let's, let's talk about, I know you, you, I don't think media pretty well, and you know, Brian comes up and says, we just got this After Effects software. And we've got to create this opening. It's got to look like that other one. And here's the box, and here's the manual. And I need it by Monday. That ever happened? Uh, sort of. It has happened to other people right. at my company <laughs> much more. <laughs> but you, you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Kind of yeah. It's like, 
hey, they need 3D. What? <laughs> I've never done 3D. <laughs> well, here, boom, you know, dust cloud. <laughs> and there goes my weekend. <laughs> so, Ben, you, know, you ever have a situation where all of a sudden they said, we got to put this new version of software on, and uh, you're in the middle of editing, and it's like this stuff isn't where it used to be? And... Not so much, because, okay. because I'm on long form stuff a little more often. But yeah, yeah I mean, if there's updates in the middle of the project, I'm not touching them. Yep. <laughs> no, nope. great role. I can wait. Yes. <laughs> She also is an Adobe harasser, so. Um, they, she but they like it. Though. Get your requests on the internet. <laughs> they and actually like it. Too. That's how they build yeah, their software. Me, After Effects kind of grew out of that. Really? No, they need that. Yeah. And I know from when I used to sell equipment, uh, I would ask the manufacturers, "How many software developers do you have on your team?" And it was like 15, 20, or 10. And then I would meet them at NAB, and I'd find them in the booth. They're the ones that actually know how the stuff works. Yeah. I got the demonstration artist, and I would say, how many times does it take different people to tell you to make a change in your software before they make you do it? Yeah. And you know, one guy would say, well, yeah, unless we get 10 requests, we're not doing it. One guy would go like, you know what? They give us all the questions, and we feel, man, we've got to do that. But some really have a throttle before that becomes dot two, dot three, dot four. And when I found like that throttle would be like 20 complaints, I go to my clients, I go, you got a bitch. If you don't want this stuff done, they ain't gonna do it. You know, and you know, the, the bigger company that had more people they could do, the smaller companies that acted like they're a big company. And then that also told me how to sell my stuff too, because like, oh man, they're not gonna take care of this stuff. Man. They're gonna die for four months before that fix comes out. What if the uh, 10 questions are coming from the same person? You could, I would suggest changing your name. I mean, you could, you could, you could, you could, you could I mean, you could do that because what happens is like, it's like, well, he's busy right now, right? You all of a sudden you're not getting through anymore. So. There's no doubt there's a wanted poster at the Adobe headquarters uh, per email address. Yeah, I guess with software, um, like things, up, the only updates that affect me are um, keyboard shortcuts because I don't want to touch that mouse. Get it out of here. Sure. I live and die by my keyboard shortcuts, and there's nothing more exciting than discovering that something that I use all the time has the ability to have a keyboard shortcut. That's just yes, like yes. nurse central. So. Yep. Yep. No, I think the best thing I try to tell my students, I, I I force them to memorize keyboard shortcuts for a test. Yeah, good. Because they ain't gonna. Yeah, that's I, I said if you do it more than five times, maybe find a shortcut. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just. I said, because you're going to walk around like this is an old man. You're at my age, <laughs> you edit for a living, you're going to have claw hands. Yeah, and it, it's you, you, you got to do it to you know keep the blood going in and stuff. But uh, you know, I said, watch a real editor. They're playing piano. Yeah. They're playing piano, and it's, it's something to watch. Yeah, my biggest problem is I ran out of keys. <laughs> <laughs> they need to make bigger keyboards. That should be an update. Well, Lona, how about you? Well, I think all the best points are kind of already said, okay. unfortunately. But um, okay, we'll start with you on the next question first. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I mean, mean I, no, that's good. Way. I can kind of piggyback a little okay, bit. Okay. Cool. Um, because I did have one situation where you mentioned, you know, does anybody ever just hand you the software, hand you a manual, and then say go for it? Um, I've had that happen before, but things change so rapidly, and you have to learn so many different kinds of software that it does get to be a little mind-boggling at certain times, but it helps when you have those universal keyboard shortcuts. You know, when you have those universal things and the same principles of editing kind of apply across the board, regardless of if you're using, you know, one software, if you're using Final Cut or Avid or Premiere or whatever you're using, um, the same basic ideas apply to literally everything. So that's kind of good. And as long as you've got those basics down, technology will change around you no matter what. And you just right. kind of have to keep up with the times and keep up with the pace of it as best you can. Okay. Um, color corrections changed greatly in the last five years. Uh, and it's changing even within the year. But my students are trying to, you know, I'm forcing them on Avid to learn color correction. Now I remember that had to go to a colorist before it came to you and that was something you never taught. When you do your documentaries, and you can talk about it in the FX room if you want also, um, how much time do you allocate to that? Do you have a specialist do that or is that forced to you as an editor on the projects that you're doing? I assume you have to do it yourself with the, the ones you're doing, but. Long form, no. Yeah. You, yeah. Yeah. Do you want to start that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. 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 Yeah.
we had, we had another um, person in the office that jumped in to help me with color correcting initially, and then I kind of tweaked things at the other side. Okay. Um, so color correcting is one of those things that I was learning on the fly. Yeah. Um, because I, I hadn't done, you know, an entire feature length film before. Um, so I honestly, I don't have a whole lot to add. Sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> but no, I think it's, well, where do you see yourself going with this? Now, did that intrigue you enough to go like, man, I'm going to look at Steve Hallfish's book and actually <laughs> watch him on YouTube or anything? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Especially being an artist. I mean, you'd think that you'd oh, go yeah. crazy with the tools on that. Yeah, the color of the scene can absolutely influence the way that people see it and the way that people feel for it, you know, and it's very important to be able to have, you know, a distinct look down for a particular project or even within a scene within, you know, multiple times within a scene, things can change. Um, so it's important to be able to have that and to be able to measure it just like that. It's such a subtle thing, but as with an artist's eye, you have to be able to tweak it in order to be able to work with it. Right. Yeah. And you, and you had a, a lot of different footage from different time periods, oh, different absolutely. cameras. Absolutely. And I know that was a mess. Of, it, I think it was shot over a three-year period, I think. Two to three-year yeah, period. Yeah, over a three-year period. Yeah. I think there was uh, about 200 hours worth of footage yeah. total. Um, and multiple different cameras, you know, and a whole bunch of, of people, you know, of different skill levels that were holding those cameras, which anybody who's edited before knows that, that could be a particular challenge. Um, if you've got a shaky shot, you've got to be able to find that one, sp that one sweet spot within it, um, but that means that everything had a different color to it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you start with white balancing and then you try to make it beautiful from there, um, which can pose its challenges, especially when you're trying to keep the overall flavor of the film rather consistent, but you're changing, you know, venues between different cities, between different, you know, people that you're talking to. Um, you don't want someone to look red in one shot and then kind of green in another. So it's kind of keeping all of that in, one, in your mind at the same time because it's hard to reference everything all at once. Um, but those kind of challenges, I think, is what keeps it interesting. Sure. No. You two can answer this together, because you both co-edited on the film. Mm -hmm. What was your relationship? Did someone do more of the color correction, or did you someone do the rough and someone did the fine, or was it like, okay, you're working on this today, and I'll, if I got time in my job, I'll do that tomorrow. How, what, what was your workflow on that film? And as far as color especially with color correction. Didn't touch color at okay. all. It went color. to uh, Brian Hardy, another guy within the company. Okay. Yeah. So he's specialist on it, and did. Uh, who talked to him about the look that you wanted for it? I mean, was that? That was uh, Jeff, the art director. Jeff, and I Jeff did that, okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't have, you know, I, yeah, it came from obviously Jeff, the director, but, right. um, but it is, you know, this year we have, our, as our company, we have two films in the film festival, yeah. and they were the first, um, they, they really were the first two uh, projects, or at least our long form projects that have a legit full fledged color grade, yeah. you know, um, using Da Vinci and, and everything else. Um, and the results show, I mean, it, it makes sure. a huge difference. And um, personally, I think they, they both look fantastic. And we are lucky where we have become big enough as a company to become specialized. Mm -hmm. Uh, where we can buy enough time for uh, our colorist to work for five, six straight weeks yeah. grading uh, the film um, sure. without being interrupted. This, Jeff, how do you feel about the color, you know, and working with them and all that? Is, is it just like you kind of like threw a pizza out of the door and said, go for it, <laughs> I'll see you tomorrow? Or? No, I mean, it's... it's Color, it's, it's, you may not realize it, but it's a thing unto itself, and it's, yeah. it's a really deep pool that you're diving into, because what you can do with a 4K image yeah, is pretty crazy. astonishing yeah. in, in software like DaVinci. Yeah. So um, even going into that feature, it started with the DPs, and we had a look that we were going for. Yeah. So we had that template and that look of films that were like ours that I could point to okay, and say, great make it look like that. Because I'm kind of a dummy. Yeah. I, I can't tell you how to do it, but yeah. I can point to the picture and say, please make it look like that. Oh, that's good. You know? That's good. And actually, they need that. They need that you have direction. To, Otherwise, without it, yeah, it's kind of hard It's kind of hard to talk about color with words. Yes. What is that expression that's like, uh, uh, talking talking about music is like dancing to architecture? Right. I'm, I'm sure I'm getting that wrong. But sure. Something, but you know, you get my point. I mean, they may know, like, make it look like Rembrandt. 
Yeah. But you know, only so many things you can do. Re it, references. Right? <laughs> Colorists appreciate references. Yes, they, yes, they do. Now, now you've done a lot of uh, VFX work. Yeah. And, and, and you've had to like go through stages of getting things in and out. What, what's your relationships been? And what have you done in color correction? And what's your relationships oh, on color. projects you've worked on with it? Um, so. Uh, a little bit about what, what I do, I mostly independently produce, um, okay. but to make the money on the side, I do a lot of post supervision. So okay. companies like, I guess, yours or commercial companies or features will hire me to take you through a pathway of finishing the film. Um, and as post soup, it's all about connections, mm -hmm. and also Los Angeles is sort of like that. Um, but uh, I've been blessed to be able to work with some of the kind of higher end companies like Light Iron when they were first starting with Red, and then now we've moved a lot to Technicolor and a mm -hmm. few different things. So. Working with professionals like that, it's a crazy sort of different world. Sure. Um, but I started in the basis of, you know, now it's so easy for everyone. Now it's so great that you can take red footage into your premiere timeline, export it into Resolve, and there you go, you're grading. As long as you've got some sort of screen that is somewhat calibrated, you know, you can do it. But, um, it, you know, back in the days when we had to do, you know, uh, offline, online, and I still do that on projects, which yeah. is kind of interesting, especially with film. Um, VR is, uh, we'll get there. But um, <laughs> it's, it's a nightmare. But the biggest thing I wanted to bring up that, that I didn't know as a young filmmaker and a young post that I think it's really important is different standards. Um, you make a film, you make it great, and then you actually go to sell it. Um, we made a film, I, I'm, I was a producer on a film called Cretia, a little film, um, and it ended up blowing up in AQ4 bubble crazily, which is nuts. But um, they, we had to completely recolor the film because when we colored it, we were completely outside the spec that, the, um, that they wanted. Yeah. Um, and then you're also looking about going into P3, or you want to go into XYZ, which is a color standard that's really weird that you go into DCP, which is how all these things are projected these days. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have that in mind when you're right. doing something, you're going to lose a lot of money to, to yes. do that again. And it's very expensive. You know, you get into the world of XYZ coloring or m and &E sound mixing is a real big money problem. You're looking at 10, 20 grand just to go back and do a music effects track. So, uh, depending on your film. But that's the biggest thing I can give advice for is yeah. just think about that and where you're going. Try to learn as much about those standards because um, that's the biggest thing. So. That's good. That, that kind of dovetails into the question of let's talk about the workflow from the pre production and how it gets handed to an editor and what the editor's role is or should be mm -hmm. from the front through to the end and making sure that the, everyone is on the same page on the standards. What, how, do, how do you communicate? across the many different uh, So I'll let them, things. I'll let you guys kind of do the standard stuff. I'll talk about VR because it's crazy. Okay. And, and no one really knows. Yeah, VR um, is... Yeah, so with VR you shoot with a bunch of different cameras in a circle, basically. And then you have some wizards, basically, put this stuff together in what we call an equ equirectangular, which is a two by one image that essentially if you take a map, if you have a map of the earth, you know, that's on, like it's flat, that's kind of what you're looking at. Um, it turns into a sphere. So. When you do that, things like exposures and stitch lines and all this kind of weird things start to happen. And so it's not a situation where you have a raw metadata R3D or something like that. You have this weird thing that some guy thought that this is where you should be, that you're constantly looking okay. at to change. Okay. And then you take those and you put them in a traditional timeline and you can edit them. But there's weird, weird rules where editors are kind of losing their minds because you can't cut. You, you have to fade cut or dip to black or, you know, we're sort of still stumbling through how you do this type of stuff. And then, if you usually you do that at a low resolution, and um, it has stitch problems, stitch errors. If you guys have worked in VR, you know what I'm talking about. That's very rapidly going to diminish, but the way the technology is now, that's how it works. So then, this is the real pain in the ass, is that you have to then go to the final stitches. But there's not a time code, because you're using, in some cases, 10 to 12 different GoPros that each have a time code. And they don't adapt a new time code on top of it, so to link back to the original footage is a nightmare. So we do it by frame, which is crazy. And then we'll take that, and then you go into you know, Technicolor or Resolve or something like that. And then they don't even know the spec to color it in because it's going on an Oculus, which Technicolor hadn't even, when I, we were there, they were, they were still trying to define the specs of what that was. Or a Samsung phone, which mm -hmm. who knows what that is. Right. So it's just a whole, that's kind of my world of nastiness. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, yeah, yours um, is a moving target. Yeah. Great, you know, <laughs> then you do VFX on top of that. So. My anxiety is great. <laughs> See my hair? <laughs> it will be there in a couple of years. Soon, yeah. It's going to be there and this, I feel, is going to go first. So it's already starting to go. <laughs> well, you guys are kind of fortunate because you all work together. Uh, and stuff like that. Yeah. But and, I mean, you still got to have those conversations. And for this film, it was an extremely unique situation. 
one to have two editors basically split down the middle. Um, and the reason was that is the RNC was shot here in July, obviously, and we tried to get it flipped and ready, at least a rough cut for the festival circuit, sure. which is basically end of uh, October, I believe. So we had l less than two months to turn 150 hours of footage into some sort of <laughs> blob of a documentary that could be sent out. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> we uh, so we started the same day the, the crew basically started. We had a, a home base downtown Cleveland when the RNC started. Uh, Danielle and I were both there. And as the crews came back, we were offloading. Um, the first thing we did, um, you know, we're, we're actually kind of the same in that we're a little OCD and it's like organize, 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 especially long form. Yeah. You are never organized enough if you're doing long form. I mean, it, it you know, make 50 folders inside of a folder, you know, it's, <laughs> it, 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 it will always help. And so while we were there on site, um, we were, you know, offloading. Luckily, you know, the, the producers are in and out too, so we can ask questions right there and make sure it was really chaotic, but we did a good job of communicating with everybody. Um, and the first thing we did on site was just to get everything synced together. There's lots of action. There's, you know, big crowds of people. There's the boom guy gets cut off by cops and he's three miles down the road, you know. So there was a lot of obstacles where we had to like, we were like, let's just get everything synced by the end of the RNC. We go back to the office after that and then just like, Okay, now what the hell do we have here? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I'll defer to Danielle as far as what happened when we got to the office, but that uh, the the on-site thing was something that we have, have rarely done before. It was fun though; it was very exhilarating. Yeah, you guys had a lot of rules you had to follow. And yes, protocols. It wasn't a normal shoot at all. No, yeah. not at all. Amazing, you got that much footage. Out yeah, of that. seriously, that yeah. was, was yeah. tough. Yeah, it was four crews rolling uh, independently throughout. For four days nonstop. So that presented its own challenge because there wasn't any one crew had seen all of the footage from the other crews. Okay. So we're, we've got two months to make a story out of this thing. Right. And we know what we have. So. Is there uh, anything you would have done logistically different to help the communication lines in that? I don't think so. No? I think that we thought about that pretty thoroughly up yeah. front. Um, yeah, so I mean, our first thing was to put our footage, what we had on paper. Yeah. And lots of color coding, uh, anal retentive um, list making and yeah. outlining everything that we had. And Keith and I had it broken down by these are beats that we've got, these are uh, you know moments, these are um, all color coded by what it was. And then how do we figure out you know with Jeff obviously how to tell the story? Yeah. First of all, what is the story? And, yeah. You often don't have a, a moment where the director has also no idea what you've gotten until yeah. a few days later. Yeah. We had this court board and he's like, oh, so we got all that. I mean, there was just so much happening. You know, and he's part of one of the crews, obviously. So, you know, it was like, it was just like, it took a while to realize what, what all we had first before we dove in. Any perspective from the director on the... No, that was pretty accurate. <laughs> I was one of four crews, so there were three other crews out there. I mean, I knew what they were covering, yeah. but I wasn't, I couldn't, you know, I was getting a nightly debrief from each one of the producer directors, director, so I could understand how their arcs were developing, how their character assignments were going, but, you know, you, you never know what you have until you watch the thing. And the, there's pictures on the Facebook page of that cork board that Danielle's talking about, and it's pretty colorful. <laughs> There's a lot of lot of lot of angles, a lot of lot of lot of alleys we could have gone down. So these guys, you know, when it came down to actually fashioning the story, you know, I'd like to mention they're both credited as writers. Okay. Because so much of their contribution was actually fashioning the story. Um, it, it's it was you know the, the editorial on a project like that, a lot of it is writing. Sure. Sure. Now you're in a different perspective. Yes. You you kind of came into uh, they were looking at this and going. What the hell? They had like three other editors work on it, and it was what the hell. Mm -hmm. And then they said, "There's this nice girl in California 
you know, we can send this stuff out to, mm -hmm. you know, let's give her a crack at it. So you weren't in any of the workflow process of anything with this. You were just given all this. So I know this is oh, a yeah. hard answer for you. Any perspective you want to give on that? Well, I feel like I got kind of lucky in the fact that it was already beaten to a pulp by so many people to begin with. Um, and it was, yeah, it was given to that nice girl in California. And then when uh, the director came to me and said, here's what we've got, here's what I hate, uh, but here's what I like, and then I knew what direction I could go from there, you know? Yeah. And I got lucky in the fact that I had at least pieces to begin with that I could start stitching this together. He had written um, basically the, the, the basic story outlines of all the characters and said, okay, here's how we want Dominic's story to go. You know, here's how we want Gino's story to go. Here's how we want Brian. How do we weave this together? And I said, all right. And I sat down with this 20 page script um, that he handed me of all these different people, you know, and everybody has like five, four or five pages each, you know, and I started cutting them out and I, I taped it to the back of my door. And um, he said, yeah, you know, that could work, but let's move this around here, you know, let's do that around there. So in the same way that you guys had a cork board, I had painter's tape and a door to work with. And, and it's kind of a unique experience to be able to do that. And then, because when you see it there, on, you know, in paper, you know, you see it in beats and you see it and you have it, the idea forming in your head and then you start throwing things on the timeline and hoping for the best. And then things start to take shape, you know? And then um, I had basically the director sitting over my shoulder for a lot of it saying, you know, oh, let's move this over here, let's do that over there. Okay, well now this seems to be making sense. Okay, perfect. So it was kind of a, it was a lot more collaborative of a process that I'm really used to as an editor because a lot of the time um, um, the editing process is basically here's the footage, here's what we're doing, make it. You know, we need it by Friday. You know, and I, and I was used to that for commercial projects of like, okay, upload it, it's going to be on the air tomorrow. Perfect. All right. Um, and then it was well, we want this thing to be done whenever it gets done. So it, it was a different kind of process for me, and as the editor, it was kind of my job to uh, simultaneously encourage the good ideas and put my foot down on the bad ones, you know, in terms of the directoral process. <laughs> uh, but it, it all seemed to work out where, um, because it's that kind of collaboration, it gives more of a unique perspective um, from, the, from the story. You know, it, gives, it lets the story speak for itself at that point, which was kind of really nice to do. So now it's you have a little fun. <laughs> what, what is your, from an editing standpoint, what is the favorite film you've ever seen, and why? What made you say, from an editor standpoint, that that one kind of hits it for you? I can let anyone go who can find one in their head. I know, right? Okay, okay don't go ahead. Start ahead. With no. <laughs> uh, Dear Zachary, documentary. Why'd you like that? Um, I thought his editing was so brilliant. First of all, I mean, it, the movie looks like shit. It was shot on like a one check camera. And it doesn't matter, it's just, mm -hmm. it's just proof that the, the story is so much more important. Right. And it's in, incredible, but his editing style, he did this thing that stayed with me forever where he would use sound bites uh, at various points in the movie, pulling them out of context to assign a new meaning, meaning to them. Okay. Um, so you would hear somebody say something and it would be in context, you understand what it means, and then he would revisit that statement later and you're just like, no. <laughs> So good, and it's just the storytelling. I mean, I don't know if anybody knows what it's about, but it's a horribly tragic story. Um, I'm not gonna go into it; it's too sad. Yeah. But uh, it's a tragic story with a beautiful ending, and he just finds a way to, uh, yeah, make you walk away feeling like you can keep living at least. It's pretty bad. So. <laughs> um, mine is a is a scripted uh, film actually, and I don't know if anyone is familiar with uh, Into the Wild with Emil Hirsch. Mm -hmm. Um, it is one of my favorite films of all time, and I think it's it's a film that makes you realize you don't need to be loud and crazy and fast all the time to be to be good. And um, there's just so much qu quiet and and just like this beautiful quiet. You know, it's nature and the fact that it jumps all over the country and it's just beautifully sewn together. Um, it's very hard to explain, but that was the one that really caught my attention. It was like, man, this is like, you know, I'm feeling all this emotion without even hearing dialogue and all this right. other stuff. So um, that was that was really a game changer for me. Sort of like a, a jazz musician once said, uh, when you're doing improvisation, you're in a solo. It's the silent parts of the solo that the people can react to. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and it's, it's kind of editing is the same way. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Strike you. Um, so I'm not an editor, but uh, admittedly, um, but I have a friend who loves editing, and she would for her I'd say okay. anything Guy Ritchie. She's super into Guy Ritchie. So, um, but I'll tell a fun story about him that I think is cool. Um, I like big epoch films. Braveheart's one of my favorites. <laughs> say what you will about Mel Gibson, but you know he directed, starred, and produced that film. Anyway, so they were quite long in production, and they were shooting actually in Scotland, and the editor was in their little hut, and it was sinking into the mud, <laughs> and it'd been two weeks, and the first scene they shot was when his, uh, hopefully, well, yeah, his <laughs> wife dies, is killed. Oh. Spoiler! Yeah. Spoiler alert! <laughs> <laughs> you haven't seen Braveheart by now, but, <laughs> but <laughs> anyways, so, so Mel Gibson is the kind of guy, I only met him once, I haven't worked with him, but apparently he's like a kind of jovial, kind of, you know, jumps up and does crazy stuff, and every every take in that movie he did, in sh every scene in that movie he did in two takes, and usually huh. the second one, uh, the editor told me that it was just a safety, and everything was the first take, wow. it was incredible, um, including the freedom thing, everything. Oh, you so, kidding. Yeah, so he's on set, no one really knew this guy, and he, you know, they were like, who's this Mad Max guy person, <laughs> and uh, they didn't trust him, and he's kind of jovial. So they, they cut the scene, and um, they cut the scene of you know his, his lover dying, and, um, and he's like, oh my god, we gotta pull everyone in here. So they pull the whole crew in there, this whole crew that doesn't like him, and they play the scene, and it just plays, and everyone just weeps. And it's actually the same sequence you'll see in the movie today. Um, and it was like the first cut, which is amazing. And um, I just thought that was such power. And, and then no one questioned him, and they actually went on for like, I think 100 days of production, which is outrageous. Wow. But um, it was just, I think that's the power of editing. It's, yeah. it's cool. You got one up? I do. Okay. Uh, well, it's, it's hard to pick. You know, you have like a top sure. 10 list running in your head for various reasons. Well, um, my most recent one, uh, I really like the way that La La Land was edited. Uh, it's got a really nice sense of pacing to it, a really nice sense of, it doesn't ever drone on for too long except for the moments when you're supposed to feel the heaviness, you know, I, I don't know if anybody's seen La La Land, but um, it's, you know, you've got these moments between these two lead characters, these romantic moments that are supposed to be quick and happy and supposed to keep you, you know, on the edge of your seat, but then you've also got these slower moments where they feel more human, and I feel like part of the role of the editor is to make things more human-like. We're not supposed to, you're not supposed to feel the cuts, you're not supposed to feel the pacing, you're supposed to feel like you're in the moment. And so the best part of being an editor, I suppose, is when you feel invisible, because then you've done your job right. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, now we can get to a personal editing question, or a personal production <laughs> question for you. What, what is your favorite work that you did, in just a section of a film or a section of a, a project that when you did it, you're like, I got that. I'm like, Phew, I got it. And you even actually went back and liked it, because uh, you probably don't like anything you ever edited. Right? I mean, I tell my students, I like, the older I get, the worse my stuff was. I thought it was great. And then like a year later, it's like, five, that, that was pretty slow. And then like five years later, it's like, I don't know if anybody ever sees that. And it, because you, you change with that. But in the moment, when did you feel you did something that was like, yeah, I can go home early tonight. <laughs> Anyone could take anyone, whoever's got that moment. Um, well, I feel like the there are several moments in the movie that I've, you know, in Breaking Balls that I just did that uh, I really liked the best, but I feel like the ending is really what comes down to it. Uh, when you're able to sum everything up and when you're able to have that final, you know, the ribbon on top of this nicely presented gift that you've just wrapped and handed to the audience, um, I feel like was a really fulfilling thing to do. Um, because I, I really liked being able to tie all the loose ends together and being able to stitch it into something that makes the most sense. So, um, of course, I really liked it, but then you have to go back through and, and redo it, you know, if someone else sees it differently and someone else mm -hmm. notices something different. But that's something that I'll, I'll always like, is the ending. Okay. I think my favorite moments from each project I've worked on were scenes that weren't a part of the original plan, and it was, how am I gonna, I gotta get from point A to point C here. So I gotta come up with some kind of B on the spot. <laughs> and you just like shuffle through old footage and you're, you don't know what you're looking for, but you know it when you find it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it, it, that scene comes together and it's like, fuck yeah. yeah. <laughs> there it was. <laughs> I hope they can bleep you too. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, one just off the top of my head, is in the, the current film um, that's playing at the film festival, 
Um, it's a, from everyone's reaction to it, uh, it's a very emotional scene and it deals with a very tricky subject matter. Um, and it was definitely one where I needed to do it justice, but I needed to be careful with it too. Um, and it dealt with the, the weeks during the RNC and before the RNC where there seemingly every day was either a African American getting shot by a police officer or police being shot by uh, citizens. And the scene itself actually takes place in a, uh, a barber shop on the east side of Cleveland. And which was very unplanned as far as, we were planning on going there as, as part of uh, the days, but the conversation was unplanned. It was unprompted, uh, but they are very, uh, the, the, the barbers and the patrons are just very up to date on the news. So they were talking about it and it went from like zero to a hundred in, and there was, they were mentioning various incident, uh, incidents that were happening uh, in the news. And so, I got the idea, well, why don't we cut back and forth from uh, what they're talking about to showing the specific incidents that were captured on cell phone footage and things of that nature. And, um, you know, a lot of people have seen these various videos that have been on the, you know, all over the internet. And, um, um, but I chose to like, there's a fine line. It's like, you want to be graphic because you want to get your point across, but you also have to realize these are people's family members mm -hmm. and things of that nature, and, and every Joe Schmo shouldn't just be grabbing these and, and, and putting them out there. Right. Right. Um, so it was a very fine line of, of how much to show, um, and then you know what one of the routes we chose to, to, to take was just using a lot of the audio from them on black screen, and it, it brought a whole new level to those to those um, those news clips and it was something when I was done with it it like it was one of those where you like you lock the door and you're like all right I'm not coming out for like four <laughs> hours because you're like in it and it was one of those afterwards where I, it was like okay uh, this is gonna be I think this is gonna be a, a powerful moment in the movie and and uh, it from from everyone's reaction to it it sounds like it, it has been yeah. so most rewarding part of working is watching an audience actually get what you want them to get. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. that's the greatest feeling. It's you know, almost even better than Jeff Payne. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they see why he left. Yeah. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. That's why I said it. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah. Again, I'm not an editor. I cannot do what the, these no, guys no, talk about. It's you, magic to me. It's several big types of smoke. Um, but there is one film that I have an editor credit on, and I'm talk about that one because it's one of my proudest films. Um, so out of, I went to UCLA, and out of film school, I met these crazy master students, crazy guys, and they came to me. And I, they said they want to make a film all on POV. So I was like, okay, let's do it. So I worked on a film called Random Stop. And it was about a police officer named Kyle Dean Keller who was unfortunately killed in Lawrence County, Georgia. Um, and so um, basically what we did is it was all filmed on dash cam video and they use it for training. And so we completely recreated the whole thing mm. as if you are the protagonist with a camera okay. on your face. And we had this crazy idea that we wanted to do it all in one -er, you know. And, and as a producer, I was like, oh my God, you know, we had a police <laughs> chase in it, you know, there's guns, I was, there's no way I can get an armor and be like, yeah, get out of that car and shoot that gun, yeah, let's do that, yeah, so, so we had to figure out how we were going to make this work, and um, I did a lot of visual effects on it, and we were able to blend between these different shots, and, you know, we did a wet pan once, but we actually reconstructed, you know, different shots together, and, you know, you can look over, and there's one where you look to the dash, and there's a cut there, and you'll never see it, right, because it's so well blended, and it's a six minute short, and I encourage you guys all to see it, it's, it's just, it's really intense, but it's great. And um, that was one of my process moments because we, we went to South by with it and um, someone asked me like, how did you, how did you right. do all this stuff in one take? And I was like, seven takes, <laughs> seven, <laughs> seven, seven right. shots, but thank you. And I was just like, that's the power when yeah. you, you know, the invisible cut, as you said, and, you and know. And you know when it happens, you're like, yeah. ah. I got goosebumps. You live for them, you yeah, live for those them. moments. Yeah, it's just you know, so great. Yeah. Of all the other yeah. stuff you call through. And, and, <laughs> yeah. and it's like, Anything you
you guys just want to talk about in general and editing what it means to you or in your craft? What what is what does it mean like to your parents? What do you tell your parents? Editing and crafting a story <laughs> means to you that they would like and understand. We just both think of each other's <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> they don't get it. <laughs> um, I, you know, I'm not so sure. But, uh, yeah, they'll never understand. You know? <laughs> um, but you know, do they see I, the passion in you when you talk? Yeah, about absolutely. It? I mean, and and I think um, you know we just had the premiere of the film on Thursday, and and we had a little bit of an a, an after party gathering, and and this has happened before me. And I guess the uh, great compliment to me, and I don't even know if it's a compliment, but I take it as one, is where somebody just comes up to you and just goes. How did you do that? You know, like they can't wrap their heads around taking just endless amounts and all over the place and weaving it all together. Even my our own boss can't even comprehend it. You know, <laughs> like he comes in, he's like, "Woo, I'm out of here!" Like he's like, "What is that?" <laughs> um, you know, and I think that's just kind of like it makes you feel like, okay, you know, it. it it is a, a, it is sort of a special skill that not everybody can do, right. and everybody thinks they can do it nowadays. Where everybody, you know, it's so easy to do it. Um, but but those the, the the people that come up and just be like, I can't even wrap my head around how you put all this together. Uh, that's kind of a, a, the best compliment for me for myself. Yeah, well, I want to hear it one time as well. Okay. Um, and I didn't write it down, so I can't remember it. No, it's just like, how do you explain to someone or that they get what you're doing and how you feel good about your craft and how they understand you feel good about your craft? How could, like I said, how if you explained it to your mom, what really makes it work for you? What would that be? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, well, I mean, that's an easy one for me because my dad actually comes from uh, television. So he did he did television for years. He used to have his own um, like local talk show down in Akron, and um, so he's always known about editing. He's he was the one who first taught me about storytelling and stuff like that. So that's an easy one. Explaining it to his girlfriend gets kind of tricky. Like, what do you what do you do with all those pictures and all those videos and all that stuff? Well, you see, I, I try to assemble it into something that makes sense, you know, and it's, I get paid to do it, okay? And <laughs> she's like, oh, okay, well, whatever puts, you know, whatever puts bread on your table, that's fine. You know, it's good to go. My friends are a little more understanding because they understand it from an, from an art aspect. Mm -hmm. You know, they're like, oh, well, you tell stories, but in film and in pictures. Okay, that's great. I tell stories in paint, you know, or I tell stories in sculpture, and that's it's a different kind of storytelling. So you have to be able to relate to people, you know, and talk in their language, which I feel like as editors we kind of already have this distinct ability to do because we interact we interact with so many different kinds of media and so many different stories all the time. We kind of already have an innate ability to be able to communicate that to people. So. I'm not sure if that answered your question. Uh, but it was a hell of an answer. <laughs> <laughs> Great answer. <laughs> How about yourself? Oh. Especially you're doing this kind of weird stuff. I, mean, <laughs> kind of stuff. Yeah, I know. Um, you know, I, I take a, how I explain it, I, I take a philosophy towards co-supervising as I do towards producing, which is, you know, film is collaboration. And I'm going to keep saying that so I can get it on my, like, IMDb page. Like, well, <laughs> I wonder what age that happens at. <laughs> oh, what do you have to make, like six films? Anyway, um, so I, I'm only as good as the team around me, and I love it when I find someone who is very finite in their brain, oftentimes really creative people, their brain works in a really strange way, and they don't know how to do assistant editing, but they know how to cut, they know how to cut, and I love facilitating a, a, a workflow or a, a strategy to be able to make them be able to flourish, you know? Oftentimes they want to work in Avid, which I don't understand, but, you know, it, just the idea that you can create a great roadmap, you know, and, and get them involved and also integrate some really new technology that's on the horizon that's really great. I love that. And that's that's kind of how I explain to people why that's what filmmaking is. I mean, this business, if you're thinking about getting into it, it's crazy, you know. And and now I'm starting to get in the world where it was before it was all about money and how you're gonna make it, and now it's all about ego and politics, you know, and that's a whole new horrible thing. But um so many challenges that you wanna be surrounded by good people, you know, and, and that's the biggest thing. Sure. Yeah.
I think we're ready for some Q&A here. So uh, if not, I'll come back and fire more questions. So anybody have a question? Yes, right here. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so how do you mind? How exactly did you get your foot in the door in your field? And once you get it in, does that make it any easier to find more a stable position? Or are you always constantly looking for your next project? Um, for me, I got lucky it was really new. Um, I think that's what it is a lot of the time, but you have to grab those opportunities when they come to you. And they, they're not always what you want at first, but um, you have to know that that's going to uh, open the other doors for you. And again, like keep doing stuff on the side. Like I have side projects going on almost constantly. Um, because you're, you know, sometimes the stuff that pays the bills isn't always what feed your soul, so you have to make sure that you're doing that stuff constantly or you will go insane. <laughs> and those things do all, often get you new opportunities as well. I can say I would not have had the opportunity to d direct for the ships, I don't think, if it hadn't been for other side projects I had done, not for my company that my boss saw and saw that I cared and had the passion to do it, so yeah. yeah. And just be persistent. I mean, I. Um I interned at the company that I work for now, and my internship was over. I graduated, and I showed up the following Monday. Uh, I wasn't, I didn't have a job, but I, <laughs> I showed up, up. And, uh, and, you know, the company was pretty new, so they were like, well, if you want to just go play around on a computer, go ahead, and I, and I did, and by 10.30, I had already been given a project, and worked basically full-time freelance for the company for about a year until uh, we were stable enough to hire me on full time. But um, freelance is a really, really great way to go uh, right out of school. Um, you know, there's, there's, it's hard to get a, a full time job right away. I mean, some people are fortunate enough to do it, um, but freelance is a great way to, to, to go. And it's, you know, it may be some, somewhat difficult to even find freelance gigs, but uh, piggybacking off Danielle is, you know, you're in video, you, someone in your family is gonna ask you to make a slideshow or a wedding video or something, and forever, by the way, they will ask you to do that. <laughs> um, but, you know, you just make it the best you can, so that, and that may be the only thing you have to show somebody, but if you can blow their socks off with a wedding video, then they'll be like, you know, they can take a chance on you. And you just build and build that network, and, and you know, we have this gaggle of freelancers that we use all the time in the area and it's um, it's like a fraternity it's a union or, or whatever you want to call it um, and once you get in you're in you know and it, it's it's pretty amazing but just be persistent uh, oh, actually, um, okay I don't know if we, um, did you do you know what you're looking to do what, what area you want to be in in film uh, yeah behind behind the scenes Behind the scenes, behind the scenes, video editing. Like right now, I I just do small stuff. Like I'm I'm using HitFilm Four and Audacity. Mm -hmm. But uh, most the biggest thing I've done was for the uh, school project here, mm -hmm. and it wasn't much. But I just I loved it. Yeah. So, so, so editing is kind of weird. Edit, editing. Is so so I think you're in luck um, because uh, if you go to a city like I'm from Los Angeles, like there's a lot of editing houses, or or you can go and go on IMDb, look up films that you like or styles you like or if there's filmmakers here that have a film like go and meet them you know everyone says like it's about being social they're really right and I resisted that as much as I could until I had to you know figure out how to deal with myself but um so like that's the biggest thing is go and, and do that in, in LA you you can go and intern at any one of those companies that are doing posts that are doing everything like editors are actively looking for assistant editors because no one wants to sit there and match the clapper but you can get in that way and you can learn and then once you show somebody that little creative edge they'll give you a shot they'll be like hey you know edit this scene give me a, to me a take and that's that's the way you do it um, and you can do it all by just literally googling people's name that, that's what I did that's how I started um, that's how I got a job at Paramount for a little bit is I literally emailed someone I searched on Google how to find their name what? You just send them a sample of something you've done? Or no, or just, you know, just send them an email, you know, look up whoever you're targeting and, and send them an email or to try and think about people that they're in connection with and then you just sort of like email them and say, hey, I'm interested in doing this, I want to work for you, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, 
um, yet. Any other questions? Uh, yes, in the pink. So I, so I love shooting. I've always found editing to be a huge challenge. And so I was really excited to come to this panel and just kind of try to figure out what it is for me that makes editing a challenge. And I'm trying to figure out what qualities make a good editor, whether it's a comprehensive understanding of various software programs or you know, the ability to make an ergonomic workflow that works for you, that's intuitive and effectual, or being able to communicate with directors and producers and things like that. I think that for me, the biggest challenge is like how to have the emotional fortitude to leave half of your project on the floor. And so you've done a really good job of like identifying and nailing those moments where you know you've nailed it and you have that like fuck yeah moment where you know this is the right direction for your project. And I was just wondering to get a little feedback from you, like how much of what you do falls neatly into fuck yeah, you know you've nailed it versus having to mourn your dead ba the babies that you killed. You know? <laughs> and like how do you find the emotional fortitude to carry on when you've left half of your, oh, that's half so your project? Yes, that's, a lot. that's probably that's the hardest, true. the biggest thing for me. Yeah, the truth is it takes, it can take days to cut a scene and it takes somebody two seconds to tear it down. So yeah. it sucks <laughs> and you have to do it over and over and over again. Yeah, but I mean how often do you hit it the first time? Not very often, I don't think. You have to have <laughs> rhino skin, is what I think. Yeah. Yeah. You, will, you will instantly hate anybody that tells you that it's not good. Yeah. And then you'll go to bed and you'll come in and you're like, you know, you were absolutely yeah. right. <laughs> you have to right. Yeah, there's ego involved. It's like, oh man, I love this so much. But they're seeing it and they don't know what was in your head when you were doing it. Right. So you had an intention. It didn't come off the way that you thought it was going to. So you have to cater to an audience. You have to enjoy your failures. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with oh, that, um, I was talking to one of my professors, and he mentioned that when you're in the editing room, sometimes the best editor sits there, and like when they have this big project and it's going over time, they sit there and take the one shots that they love the most, and they have to cut those down versus the ones that they don't like. So have you guys really came to that? point in your editing where you're like, oh my God, I love this shot so much, I don't want to let go, but what is it about this shot that I love and how can I just throw it out? Oh, I'll fight you then. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll find some way to get it in there. <laughs> <laughs> it has to go. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it, just on a, a, a broader scale of um, sort of organizing and things like that, you know, um, I never delete anything because you never know when you got to go back and whatever. So, so I start with all the footage and then cut it down in half and duplicate that and then cut it down again and cut it down again. And so you kind of actually put blinders up as to your question. You start distancing yourself from stuff that you thought you really loved and then you're like, yeah, you know what, I don't think I need it anymore. Um, and you just whittle down into what you really find is, is essential. Um, and, and, that, and then just focus on that. And that really helps me manage it all. Because if you just leave it in one big chunk and you're going back and forth like for days and days, it, it just gets overwhelming. So the more you just kind of whittle it down, you forget about some of the stuff, you know, the, the dead babies. Uh, and, and, that is a weird term. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, that's kind of just what I do. I, I I whittle it down and then I only focus on that small portion until it becomes a point where like where the director waltzes in and goes, "Don't we have this?" And then you gotta like go back like six versions and find out, you know, find something. But to what what Keith said, I'll do sometimes I'll do a scene a couple different ways uh, before I even show the director at all because. Part of it is selfishly. I've got a couple different ideas how I want to approach it, and I don't really know which one's going to be better until I do it. And I also want to have a little bit of an argument in my back pocket. Mm -hmm. And Jeff and I work together enough that I know what he's going to say before he says it. He said, "What if we do this?" And I'm like, <laughs> And sometimes, you know, Jeff especially, like he wants to try everything. So he, sometimes they'll go back, and that's why you don't delete anything.
Yeah. <laughs> so you're an editor, right? It says on your IMDb. Nice no, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah. yeah. Now, now they've got these little cameras, 3D, 360. Yeah. You know, save you a lot of time. Now. But my question's a little out there, but um, one of the reasons I lo love to edit uh, directing is you guys were talking about explaining it to a parent or breaking it down. Sometimes I found, you know, when I was communicating things on the fly with a group, whatever, socially, that would often be tricky. I'm wondering if it helped change the way you look at things or approach conversations or, as I love the time to have control over time and space and work towards laying it down. I wonder if personality-wise, has it changed you guys over the years? Uh, or, or has it enhanced you know, the way that you communicate day to day? Any thoughts? Or did you come into it because of that same thing? Uh, no, I think, yeah, I think it has enhanced things. I mean, like you're telling a story, so. The weird thing is, though, as an editor, you're telling a story with somebody else's words. Uh, and then you have to figure out how to use your own mouth to do it. Uh, which can be tricky sometimes. I'm just talking until someone else does. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'm talk about from a filmmaking perspective, oh man, I, I line produce a lot, so my job is to be like super dad. You know, I go on that vacation and take 40 guys with me, or <laughs> men and women, whatever. And um, yeah, so my life, it's very hard to relax. So I just went on vacation, so just to try and relax a little bit. But um, I don't know, it's, uh, you think of things a little bit differently, for sure. Um, I do this thing where I'll be talking to someone and we'll laugh. And in my mind, I'll like, disconnect from the conversation because I'll think like that comedy TV show where it's like, you know, it cuts to the weird scene of me doing that weird activity. And then, you, and then like, people will just be like, JP, what's going on? I'm like, Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. uh, did you, you see the world differently? I feel like I can't enjoy movies anymore a little bit. Um, I try and watch them twice, because yeah. the first time I'll just be like, okay, I'm just gonna watch this one, and then the second time I'll tear it apart. But if I just watch it once, I'll just tear it apart the whole time. Oh yeah, I ruin movies for other people all the time. <laughs> um, I can't go with my dad. Sit, well, me and my dad do both do the same thing, where we both tear movies apart all the time. But. Um, in terms of communication with other people, I really, to me, being an editor makes me really shorten down on what I'm saying so I get to the essence of it. I need you to do this by then, get it done, you know, please. <laughs> um, but again, you are kind of telling stories as well. So it helps to be able to have that human aspect of it, you know, in addition to being able to whittle down to its essence. So. Is that a question? Roman? Uh, this is more of a, like an assembly thing, you know, like in your workflow. Uh, normally I write, direct, and edit my own things, which I like to call peaks and valleys of expectations and disappointments. But uh, <laughs> I've, I've had the chance to edit one project that I did not have anything to do with uh, for, my, for the 48 Hour Film Festival last year. And uh, I tend to name my files, I tend to put time code in my descriptions. I tend to put like, wait 45 seconds, this person plays with their cheek. and. I had the director come in when I was doing it and they're asking why does this take delicious? I'm like, because don't you see it? How organized are you guys with your, sh with your like how you name your shots? Like how, you, do, you guys just said you can't be organized enough. So how do you, what's your best tips for assembling your footage before anything goes on the timeline? I think everybody probably has a really different process for that, but. Um, so is there like a language that any of you guys like tend to use like with words and stuff like that? I mean, there, I don't think there's any wrong way. It's whatever works best for you. Um, you know, Danielle and I are pretty similar. We're probably about as similar as you're gonna get, but we still have differences in, in organization. Like if I ever, ever have to use her computer, she's gone through some bright idea to change all the regular keyboard shortcuts to her own versions of everything, and it is like, oh, undo, and it like shuts the whole computer down. So it's, like, it's very frustrating. So everyone has their own thing. Like, why aren't the factory ones good enough for you? <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it, you know, it, if you want to put the time in, it's just going to help you find things quicker. It's going to help you just assemble things faster. It's, it's more work on the front. And some people don't get that. Some people just want to dive right in. And we, I mean, we even have a couple people at our work, not to name names, you know, that, that do the clips named untitled, folders are untitled, inside of untitled, there's a project file inside the music folder, and it's like hell on earth, it really is. Yeah. And, and so, you know, there is no right answer, but do what works best for you. And it'll, it'll change over the years, too. 
I have a key that I will transcribe all of my, our own interviews word for word because I'm not, I'm not going to rewatch an interview a second time entirely to look for a clip. Yeah. And you know, sometimes you gotta make somebody say something they didn't say. Gotta get those words real quick. <laughs> Never do that. <laughs> So just leaned in and asked me to talk about it. So sometimes I, I um, back in the day, I would do assistant editing work. And so it's, uh, I'm sure everyone knows what that is. But, um, Don't explain yeah, it. Yeah, a little bit. But so, so each project, like they're saying, is different. And they're going to give you some guidelines as to how they want, how the editor wants to get it, right? And so, and where you, what you've shot with. Biggest fundamental concept is how you're going to sync your sound, which I would highly suggest you in the beginning. In the beginning. And that's going to either leave you with a merge clip, or you're going to do, we do offline a lot. So we'll render an R3D, we'll, you know, do whatever process we want to go through, whether it's you know pluralized, pluralized whatever, and whether it's offline. And then, for me, in terms of metadata, we, when we do doc stuff, we will either use Adobe Translate to translate, you know, hopefully seventy-five percent of what's being said, and then we'll have interns go through and do the rest. Um, and then you can actually take that data and tag it directly to when it's happening in the time cone, which is really great. And once you have that text, it sort of just figures it out itself. Um, and then, you know, any note you make in Adobe Premiere specifically, you can meta tag it and it will actually tag it into the MOV. And so you can just search that. So in your project file, you can just be like, hey, you know, yeah, what is, she, what is car being said? And it will search that metadata. So it's a world of how much metadata you can use. Um, but you just need to know, biggest mistake I see with, you know, young filmmakers and all that kind of stuff is just where do you start and where are you going? Where are you trying to get? You know what I mean? Because um, you'll get yourself in this kind of space. Um, and when I was in film school, a lot of people would they'd shoot something 30 and then they have the sound at 20. basically what we had to deal with because it was just chaotic, uh, you know, uh, RNC sort of stuff. Um, and we were probably like maybe like three hours into trying to sync audio um, uh, on the first day and we both looked at each other and we were like, we have got to find a better way. I don't care if there's a plug-in out there, there's something out there and, you know, we stumbled upon just a, something in Premiere that helps you sync it. So much, but yeah, I mean, anything the production team does to help is fabulous. We suggest things all the time. They don't listen to most of them. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, I, I mean, there's there's good and there's bad. We're the ones left that kind of have to deal with it no matter what. So. But, but it's important that you know, the editors are in the pre-production process of what would make their life easy. And you know, someone can help them with that. If they never come to the table, they're going to shoot it because they want to shoot it. God, thank you. And so, you know, if you're planning it out, yeah, there are times you want to have multiple cameras synced for that. But then sometimes it makes no sense to do that. So it's you know how you build your shot list and what works. And if you have that communication, it can make that process go pretty smooth. But if you just get, she got three years of stuff thrown at her from different yeah. cameras and all that. She didn't have any input. She came in post on it, and you know it paid in the length of time it took them to edit it. You know they were organized. Their turnaround was a month. Her turnaround was three years a month, really. And then she came in and, and, and saved it. So it's the organization in the beginning is going to save you your time at the end if everyone plays in the same sandbox. Especially if you go. Editor is on set with you, and they are there at the yeah. pre-production pre meetings, and you know, getting paid for that time. And so, if you don't, and we have turnarounds a week or two, so it's just you, know, you don't know how to play that game. You're not going to be successful. Uh, Randy, you had a question. Mm -hmm. I know you did. I just <laughs> anyone else have a yes? Okay, I know. Um, as students, sometimes we are forced to edit things that we don't want to. Um, mercenary. As <laughs> not students, we are. How do you? Uh, how do you guys? Um, well, one question: Do you guys pick up projects that you are not necessarily passionate about 
editing? And if you do, like, how do you really get through that process of really like editing something that you, in your heart, is is just not working? Uh, for me, it was coffee, uh, lots and lots of coffee, and lots of promising myself that as soon as I'm done here, I can go get ice cream. But um, <laughs> no, but for real, in terms of, I always saw it to me as a personal challenge to kind of open my horizons in terms of what I can edit and how I can approach things, even if I'm not necessarily interested in, you know, selling cars, you know, or working on other commercial projects, maybe I don't necessarily care about the company that uh, that we're doing the work for, but at the end of the day, it does. I see it more as a personal challenge, you know, um, on an artistic level, to be able to tell that story more effectively because I'm less interested in it. You know, does that mean that I would be better at something that I'm more interested in? Not necessarily, but uh, it does mean that I then have more of an interest in challenging myself. That's how I see it. Yeah, and you know, and you know, we do lots of not fun stuff where I work, and that's just the nature of the beast. You got to pay the bills, and 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 that's how it works. And um, for me, you pick and choose your battles because uh, there are projects where you know I will never mail it in. That's just not me. I won't do that. Um, but you learn what is. I want to say like it's good enough, you know, that, that it looks nice and it, and it and it's what the client or whoever wanted um, and, and, and that's, you just kind of fight through that. And then the ones you really get excited about are the ones where you're like, you know what, I'm going to stay late tonight or come in on the weekend. And, because if you try to do that with everything, you're just going to burn yourself out and it's just going to be exhausting. Now, you should do that with all your school projects. So, <laughs> extra time all day long. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, I mean, you just gotta pick your battles, you know, and, and and you know, starting off, it's actually kind of the opposite in a way is when you're trying to get a job or impress your boss or or whatever, you take something that you may not find very interesting and blow the roof off of it, and it, and that's usually when. Someone goes, wow, if they, you know, if they did that with this, well, imagine what they can do with this, you know. So that was kind of my approach was like, hey, you know, this may be something I'm not interested in, but I'm going to make this awesome spinning logo that, like, catches fire or something and just really, like, like wow, that was for a criminal lawyer commercial, you know. <laughs> but, but you just show that you can do the different things, and that's kind of the point, and, and then... You get in, you get more opportunities to do the stuff you really want to do. I, I think I'm impressed with their company that they allow them to do films while they're doing corporate work. They got to make money, and that they allow them to do something that can expand their creativity to keep them fresh. See, if you just do, I used to do so many car commercials. I turned into a car salesman. I was walking like I was talking like. And then I did carpet commercials. I was a carpet salesman. And I, and I hate it. But then when a friend would say, hey, we're working on a documentary, a, a sports documentary. Yeah, and I worked a year on that with, with Mike Bacon. I, I did their documentaries. I, I did a lot of their editing. And, and it would be like, OK, I'm doing this bullshit over here. But then, how oh, that's good. So I'm, I'm on the bullshit. It's kind of like, you know, the bar. I can be to the bar at five if I get my work done at four thirty, and, and, and I'm going to get that done because I'm going to do that. But I'm going to enjoy that part. So you got to play games with your head. You just got to play games and understand yourself. I think that also those those pro are we still in the same. Sorry, I had to go to the bathroom. Just like that. Speaking of editing, can we just oh. cut that where she is? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Nine to five is good every now and again. Yeah. Yeah. Save yourself for the six to midnight. Yeah. <laughs> or the not at all. <laughs> yeah. I think we're good. Unless we have any other questions. Anything you want to, anything you'd like to talk about that didn't get a chance to? Yeah, I'll, I'll say one thing real quick. Sure. Um, so it was mentioned earlier, but NAB, if you are into post or production or anything in between, please go there, National Association of Broadcast. Um, it's, in, um, it's in Vegas, so you can have some fun in Vegas as well. Uh, I'm from Nevada, so uh, originally. But, um, but yeah, check that out. I, the biggest point to that is new technology is changing every day, and I work a lot in new technology, virtual reality, all that kind of stuff. And it can really change the way we edit. And if you are someone who can get on that horizon, on that wave, and think about where it's going beforehand, no. oh my gosh, you can really, really leverage that. Um, I think that as much as I say I like to work with people who don't have that skill set, um, that really enjoy it, uh, it, it's a crucial thing. And it's something that I think people really need to learn. And so go out there and you know go to nofilmschool.com, that kind of stuff. Like just get into the role of what is out there because there's some really cool tech. Like Frame.io, we used that on our last project. It was unbelievable. We had our dailies on Frame.io. I could have multiple editors watching it, editing together. It's now plugged into Premiere. It's like you know we had one editor in Paris and one editor in LA. They're working together seamlessly, and I can go in and circle. Oh, this person's face doesn't work. You know, it was uh, uh, unbelievable. So. Yeah. yeah. Tools and the toys. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. It's been a nice session. Appreciate it. Give our guests a hand.